just about everything, and of course it can run with uh, arbitrary precision, which comes really handy if you have to do some unstable uh, calculation. Uh, actually, it can run several thousand digits of precision without mm, significant, well, with re very reasonable slowdown. Right? And 100 digits is just almost as fast as uh, machine precision. So, so here is, so what do we do? Uh, we generate the noise. This uh, uh, simply says uh, to produce uh, uh, noise uh, given uh, the distribution and the large number of distribution functions are implemented. So here, uh, Tn, table Tn is just a normal distribution and you give it the mean and you give it the standard deviation. So we have to take uh, the square root of the variances, right? <coughs> and you produce a table of noise, essentially. <coughs> then you generate a table. Uh, TS is the table of true readings, each one copy for each sensor. And then you simply produce readings by adding uh, noise, TN, the table of noise, to the table of uh, true uh, values, the table of the signal, right? And lo and behold, this is just a plot of, uh, <coughs> of a few uh, readings, of uh, readings of a few sensors. And you can see the blue sensor obviously has much smaller variance than the orange, orange sensor. <coughs> OK, so let us now see. Then we do the following. Because we know how the noise is generated. We know the um, we know the variances of uh, each sensors. We can in fact produce the weights for the maximum likelihood estimation as reciprocals of the variances normalized to sum up to one. And then this is ma a maximum likelihood estimator, so the optimal one. And lo and behold, it's simply the weight, weights given by reciprocals of the variances times the readings. <coughs> and here we just compute the essentially the variance of such an estimate, namely the root mean square, not the variance, the standard deviation, right? Because there is square root <coughs> of such an estimator, right? Because these are the estimations and this is the true value so this will give you the um, root mean square error or standard deviation of the sensor and lo and behold you get we can run it okay on the other hand we take the error of the best that is simply the RMS value of the noise which achieved the, the, which is the smallest. So we pick up simply the sensor. This will be, of course, done by the sensor with the smallest, um, uh, with the smallest variance. So then what do we do? So this gives the, the gold standard, the maximum likelihood estimation. And now we run our algorithm. Let's see. <coughs> Uh, we start by uh, the initial estimate is simply the mean of all readings, right? The first line is the meaning, uh, the mean of all readings, and then what we do, we compute the variance, right? From the variance, we compute the weights that are reciprocals of the estimations of the variances, and then we produce the new estimate, right? So for as long as the difference between previous estimate and the new estimate obtained on this line 
is larger than the prescribed accuracy, which here is 10 to the minus 8, you keep spinning. Right? So you produce <coughs> this pseudo maximum likelihood estimation with the weights that are reciprocals of the present estimations of the variances. Right? And uh, pseudo uh, variances, which are just uh, uh, the, uh, the Euclidean distance between the readings and the previously obtained estimate. Uh, this should be actually just t. It makes no big difference, but because it's not the, just the mean, so let's remove this t minus 1 so that it doesn't confuse you. So let us choose the experiment, which is with randomly generated, uh, so that's case 1. So we will randomly generate the the variances and let's see how our algorithm performs. So you can see here that uh, um, if you look at the, so these are the uh, variances chosen. They are between 1 uh, and 5 and um, this is just the plot. So uh, then we run our iterative filtering algorithm and uh, we find the variance, the, the error of such an estimate after, and the counter tells you it says 12, which means that the iteration of uh, repeatedly of uh, iteratively computing new variances and then new estimations uh, uh, stopped changing less than 10 to the minus 8 after only 12 rounds of iteration. And let's see what we got. You see, uh, the, on the, the first entry here on this table is the gold standard of the estimators, namely the variance of the, of the estimator was 0. Uh, uh, 0.323037, right? You cannot beat that. The best sensor had almost three times as large variance. So the best sensor did, so this is what I wanted to stress to you, even when you have, when you know what is the most precise instrument, it's not that you use only its measurements. You use measurements all, of all instruments, including the sloppy ones. These are the reciprocals of the variances, right, which correspond the weights. And obviously, the smallest variance was by um, the 8 sensor, right? And if you go up here and look at the, the what random number generator, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you see it's 1.17. That's the mean of all variances. And lo and behold, this sensor got the largest weight. Now, so that's the red line, the, the optimal weights. The blue is what the iterative filtering algorithm achieved. And notice it almost precisely detected the true variances of the sensors. And notice that its error is almost as good as the error of ML. But to produce ML, you have to know the variances beforehand. This algorithm produced equally good estimation without having a clue about the variances, but iteratively estimating both the quantity measurement and the variances. 
So it looks like we solved our problem. This is what we should use. Well, life is seldom that simple. So what we are going to do now, we are going to change to case two in which the, the variances form an increasing sequence. Uh, they are i over five, right? So let us see if we run it in this case, what we get. Mathematica is very powerful, but sometimes the kernel gets corrupted and you have to quit it and redo it. Okay, so let's see what we got in this case. So look what happens now. So now these are equally spaced variances. Maximum likelihood estimation is still 0 0.24. But the iterative filtering algorithm produced precisely the estimation, the error of the best sensor. What's the reason for this? Well, the reason for this is that uh, this sensor get, got full weight. So these are the maximum likelihood weights, right? And they decrease because variance is increased. This, in this case, the algorithm slammed to the most, to the readings of the most accurate sensor. And worse, it's hard to predict. It's not just, it can slam also into our readings, not of the best sensor, if you, you know, choose the variances. And it's not that it always breaks. For example, if you run the program several times, uh, let's see if we run it once again, sometimes it actually survives because the noise is stochastic, right? And uh, let's see, it crashed again. Let's try once again, just uh, if you are patient enough and run it several times, sometimes it will produce a correct, uh, <laughs> let's see. Nope, again crash. Let's see if we try it once again. Huh? I mean, it does sometimes uh, return uh, good values, but not, uh, not always. Uh, well, we are really unlucky here. So play with this. Uh, now, the reason for that is precisely what, yes? Uh, so instead of doing this way, um, in the vertical way, can we do each sensor horizontally by timeline and model that? As as, as a sample goes on, the time scale I wrote, um, you will display a normal distribution, and then we find find that view that is uh, most likely to fit that model, and then we use that one to compute the variance for each sensor, and use that way. Now, what kind of estimator do you put if the quantity changes in a very weird way? Um, I mean, maybe the quantity is uh, a handle. I mean, if we collect the long enough, it will. Okay, so assume that uh, you are measuring uh, the voltage of white noise, right? Yeah. You will get uh, um, and say some, um, or even if the distribution is of, if the noise is not stationary, right? Then what do you do? So this has to work because this is designed, this has to work when the sensors are humans. And humans are totally angry. Today I feel well, and I'll give you all high marks. But uh, <coughs> after I had a short <coughs> philosophical discussion with my wife, <laughs> I might give you low marks, right? So it's, uh, of course, but what you propose is a good idea. What I never got from anyone is how to, co to compare these methods with st other st common statistical methods. Uh, and this can be really a very lovely project. So the problem here is precisely what the gentleman on the back uh, said. Uh, we didn't 
bound how small this can be. The, the weight function has a pole at zero. So if you get close to the measurement, the estimate of the measurement of the least and uh, uh, of the least of the most accurate sensor, for example, here, this will it will slam into these values for j equals to the most accurate sensor, and it will give it full weight. And lo and behold, uh, everyone else zero. And this is not a good estimator. Yes? Uh, if you bounce how small the weights we get, um, doesn't that mean they won't add up to one, possibly? Sorry, say it again. Doesn't that mean they possibly won't add up to one? You, they have to add to one. Yes, yeah, so, so down to what they should be, so that might so, not happen. So the way to compute this, so Vj will be, um, uh, let's call it vj hat will be mean of uh, vj, no, sorry, max, no, no, mean of v, uh, vj and some small epsilon, and then this will become 1 over vj hat divided by the sum of 1 over vj, uh, v, I guess we can put here, VK, right? So you have to renormalize with altered weights because the weights have to sum up to one, otherwise it's not a mean at all, and the whole algorithm is almost guaranteed to explode. Okay. You see, because if the weights add up to one, this is always a mean in the sense that it's always bounded by the smallest and the largest ring. So people try to solve this problem, but in the following way. Um, um, let me understand another file for you. Um, so, uh, then these two guys, uh, the Kerchoff and uh, I, I guess he's Dutch, it's probably Doreen, I don't, I don't uh, really know. Uh, so, try to solve this problem by using something called affine weights. How does the algorithm change? So what do we want to do? All of these algorithms, or most of them, share the following property. You have a distance function, which is uh, uh, of the, for the sense of j, which is sum when i goes between 1 and t of uh, measurements of that sensor at instance i uh, minus s, uh, but uh, uh, the current value est of estimation uh, of true value at i squared, right? So this is the distance, the square of Euclidean distance of the, oops, yeah of the measurement of the jade sensor and the hypothetical and the estimate of the true value at that instant, right? And your weight, you want to get a weight uh, uh, to be given to sensor J as uh, uh, some function of the least of j divided by the sum of the same function least of all k when k goes from 1 to m. What should, what property should f have? What should 
what property should f have in order that this is a reasonable weight function so that the new est, so say iteration i plus 1, can be then reasonably taken to be sum of uh, weight uh, j times the measurement of uh, uh, j with instance. Uh, so say this is the iteration uh, of, of, of iteration n, right? So this is uh, m plus one, and this is estimation for value at instant r. What should f? How should f behave? How should this function f of x? that transforms the distance into the weight, how should it behave? Decreasing. Should be decreasing, exactly. Because you want larger the distance, right? Larger the distance, you want to give it less weight. So F should be decreasing. Yeah. You see a reciprocal is clearly decreasing, but it has a pole at zero. Oh, good. Now, people tried, in fact, sadly enough, I rediscovered this iterative filtering, the first one that we just saw, um, uh, unaware of, uh, of the original work because it was uh, published in a kind of obscure you know, place that you don't look if you're a computer scientist, namely as uh, a, um, a uh, physics journal. And uh, we used it for something called compressive sensing. And we had this problem of singularity. And what we did is uh, we simply took uh, the function, rather than capping the variance, we took the function variance of j plus a small epsilon. Well, guess what? If epsilon is large enough to prevent this slamming into individual vector, individual readings, then the corresponding estimation doesn't differ much of the mean of to the, compared to the mean. So the price to make the algorithm stable is to make it completely trivial, namely just to be as good as a, as a simple mean, and we kind of. Um, uh, yeah, so for that reason, my students kept working on these algorithms, and you will see what we came up with. Now, this, um, uh, yeah, in the course of uh, uh, this uh, paper, uh, we got uh, uh, a referee called our attention to this, uh, um, uh, to this work by the Kerchov and Dorin. What did they choose for f? You need something decreasing. So they simply took max of the dist of all, uh, say, k, when k goes between 1 and n, minus dist i. So, and then the weight was, let's call this is uh, weight, this is W, uh, W, 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 uh, let's say J, this J, uh, so WJ is this, and then you get weight uh, simply as uh, WJ divided, uh, so weight J is equal simply to the weight j divided by the sum of the w, uh, wk over all k between 1 and n. What do you think? What's the problem with this function? So you simply take the largest distance of a sensor, and then you subtract the distance of your particular sensor. So clearly, the sensor with the largest distance will get value 0. 
right, when you hit the largest, but all, and smaller the distance, larger this difference. So, well, let's see how well it performs. So here we have three experiments. So in the first case, we will do a random, um, random assignment of the variances. And here it is. Let me run it for you. This is the, these files are all on the class website. Okay, so what did we do? We simply took the randomly generated variances and we will run both the first algorithm, one with the reciprocal, and the affine algorithm. And you can see here, here is the computation of the uh, recursive uh, of, of what we just did before and again uh, this is not terribly good idea to put the minus one it doesn't change much but uh, let's give t just so this is what we had at the first Loretti algorithm right in which the weights are just the reciprocal of the variances and we do the iteration, and we have the second example where the weights are, how do we compute the weights? Are maximal distance minus distance of that sensor, right? So it's the largest distance <coughs> among all the sensors minus the distance of the i sensor. Let's see how well they perform in this case. So, okay, so I think I have to update some results. That was large. Okay, let's see what we got. So, uh, after the things converge, look at this. Uh, so here, the gold standard is uh, the red one. So these are optimal weights. Blue are the Loretti, the reciprocal weights. And lo and behold, they almost match perfectly. And you know what? Uh, only one guy got weight zero. That was the one with the largest variance. Right, where the distances were the largest. And, uh, but it didn't do poorly because if you look at the results, uh, let's see, where are the arrows? Here are the arrows. So gold standard is 0 0.30. Uh, reciprocal is, you see, because when you do stochastic, all things can happen. Uh, right, the optimal is just the expected value, but of course sometimes you can get better results than the theoretical optimum simply because of the variance, right? So error best is around one, optimal estimate is 0 0.30, and look, uh, the uh, reciprocal nearly hit it exactly, but the affine didn't go bad at all. Let's see what happens when we do the sequence of increasing weights, which will be our um, next example. So if I put here two, now we have the weights that are increasing, yeah? right? How do we do? Let's see. If you, oops, if you, Look on the bottom. Uh, look what happened. The Loretti one crashed. It uh, got slammed to the sensor with smaller variance. Now, this is not very accurate, but it still kind of reasonably follows 
the variance is up. <coughs> so, in fact, it's perfectly stable, right? Uh, and uh, what, uh, it's extremely fast. You see, the iterations for reciprocals, it took 32, for alpha, it only 9, right? And the errors look pretty good, so one might think, gee, so these guys solve the problem. Why we call they open just another Pandora's box? What do you think if you use this? When can this perform catastrophically poorly? When you have a massive outlier. Exactly. If you have a huge outlier, if you have a huge outlier, then this will be huge. All of these will be much smaller and about equal. So all the weights will be about equal. And lo and behold, this is what the third example does. So in the third case, let's see how we choose. In the third case, we choose variances randomly, and then the very last one is a gross outlier, right? Has huge <coughs> variance. So let's see what happens there. If I run this, what do we get? Look at this. Now Loretti does perfect <laughs> match with the theoretical optimum. And this guy gave everyone the same weight except for the outlier. Well, let me tell you, this is not a very useful algorithm. Okay, so in fact, you see the reason I got, this is, the, you know, I do signal processing and uh, this is totally out of my scope of my interest, but uh, I was asked by former head of school, Paul Compton, we had the problem with marking fourth year thesis. Uh, that some people were totally lousy markers, some people were random, some people were just outrageously stingy or outrageously, uh, and then students would complain about the marks, and he asked me how to optimally aggregate, uh, and uh, first of uh, this uh, uh, reciprocal is uh, what I uh, came up, and uh, uh, but then we realized the problem with uh, when uh, it slams to here, so we kept looking uh, for better ways of doing things. Uh, and I'm going to show you now the third algorithm, which is homegrown, and the, the third algorithm is the algorithm that uh, Elisabettino's lab at Purdue tried to break it, and then they couldn't, and then a bunch of Indian guys in IT Delhi tried to break it, and they couldn't, and then Ishak broke it within 24 hours, uh, right, to, to my amazement. Uh, um, so, uh, how he did it, I actually never got a chance to look at his uh, um, his uh, way of doing it, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I give you his solution and you try to protect uh, uh, the, the system from this type of attack. So let me just now show you how the... But yeah, okay, first I will show you the algorithm, and then I'll tell you about this performance. You see, the bottom line is this. It's not a tragedy. It would be nice if it can be made, uh, if it can be made more robust, but uh, the, you see the attacks are kind of extremely kind of contrived, and you have to choose things in a very, very particular way that attackers might not be uh, likely to do so, it's uh, you know it's still a relatively it's useful algorithm, but it would be good to make it uh, even more robust. So, <clears throat> how does the algorithm work? It 
has two versions that approximately seem to work equally well. Uh, let me tell you what the idea is. Uh, the idea is actually pretty, first kind of heuristic idea and then mathematical idea why we actually chose uh, such a thing. Um, Okay, so this is the, this is the setup, right? We have uh, measurements of sensors. So one, two, uh, seven, uh, three, eleven, uh, four, and whatever, right? And then you have also uh, measurements here. Right, and then you have measurements also here, of different sensors, and you want to figure out how to aggregate the measurements in an optimal way. Idea is uh, to ask each sensor what he thinks about the measurements of other sensors. So, in the sense, how likely are the measurements of the other sensor to be true? Now, from his perspective, so I ask this guy, uh, here are the readings uh, of other sensors. How, what, how would you estimate what are the likelihoods to have such readings? Well, the sensor can think that, okay, the, uh, let's assume that the errors are Gaussian because Gaussian is a nice function and it actually works well even when the errors are not Gaussian, but the model still works pretty well. Uh, so you can uh, then, uh, the weight of each sensor, so the likelihood, uh, if you ask a particular sensor, say, uh, Kate sensor, What's the likelihood that Jade sensor readings are correct? Kate sensor will say this is simply the square root 2 pi times my variance Vk. 